We all have a habit of blaming those who came before us. After all, any Gen Z would blame me, a late stage millennial, for the ongoing climate crisis or the historically high levels of income inequality which are present not only in India but globally. In the same manner, people have a habit of blaming the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, for everything which is wrong in their lives. Quite often in drawing room conversations, it is naturally a point of consensus at the end of any kind of political debate that we can blame one man for all the ills which are facing today. And that is Jawaharlal Nehru. Quite often, these are on personal aspects of his life, which are towards him being called a philanderer or a womanizer, or friction with his cabinet colleagues such as Ambedkar or Sardar Patel, or even in terms of his external decision-making, which people falsely claim cost us the war with China, a seat on the Security Council in the United Nations, or the sluggish pace of economic growth. Many of these accusations are products of disinformation in what I like to call as a project of blame it on Nehru. And these usually peak around his birth anniversary, which is marked in India as Children's Day. So welcome to Amalta's Talks and today I will be reviewing Taylor Sherman's book, Nehru in Seven Myths. The book is academically rigorous yet written in a very lively manner and it is structured in a way which makes it very comprehensible for readers who would like to understand Jawaharlal Nehru, both as a person, a human being, as well as a Prime Minister. It gives insight into his decision-making by not primarily quoting from his own letters and texts, but Sherman makes a conscious decision to in fact open up the field of study and review from documents which are primary as well as secondary around his terms in office, bunching them into thematic classifications as to seven big ideas which are associated with Nehru and then questioning them a little much more deeply. Now in this review, I will not be going chapter by chapter, but only focusing on the main learnings which I found interesting in the hope that you also purchase a copy of the book and read it for yourself. This book opens up with a provocative first chapter which questions the claim that Nehru is the architect of post-independent India. And by this, Sherman means that this is a simplistic reduction of his role as in fact, a response to him submitting a resignation to the Congress party in the hot spring of 1950. Nehru had just asked permission to retire from his post even if temporarily, citing fatigue from his daily burden, to do some quiet thinking and return to myself as an individual citizen of India and not as the Prime Minister. As the book states, the image of Nehru as the titan of post-colonial India was not the creation of Jawaharlal, the aspiring supreme leader, Rather, the myth of Nehru as indispensable was orchestrated by his own party to persuade a wary senior citizen to stay at his desk. This sets the stage for the seven myths. But before I come to that, I would also like to make a movie recommendation, as has been citing in the first chapter, which is Sham Benegal's three-part series on Nehru, which I've linked in the description below. So please do watch it. For the movie, which is broken into three parts, is a visual representation of the secular iconography around Nehru rather than a dictatorial cult of personality which we witness quite often today. Now let me state these seven myths as they are in the book. The first as I just went over is Nehru as the architect of post-independent India. The second is the myth of non-alignment. Third is hegemonic secularism, then socialism and the myth of a strong state. This book ends by questioning whether India was a successful democracy through the Nehru years and also with its association with high modernism. Now, these are big words and academic concepts. What do they even mean? For instance, if you look at non-alignment, Sherman writes that it is the myth of India's proximity with the Soviet Union in the years which immediately followed our independence within a larger myth of India's non-alignment policy. Sherman states, independent India's largest trading partner was in fact the United States during the First World War as shipping from Britain had been disrupted. The US surpassed the United Kingdom to become the top importer in India, supplying consumer goods to India's tiny but growing middle classes. America's influence here on India extended beyond trade and commerce. For instance, I was lucky to walk through the campus of the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad during a visiting lecture I delivered to a public policy class on October 15th. As soon as I stepped through the iconic gates of the old campus, I saw the timeless red brick buildings designed by the legendary Louis Khan. The symbolism of these structures has been given deeper meaning by the curation of our archive 
and the exhibit brick by brick. The Indian Institute of Management, which was founded in 1961, was a unique collaboration between the government of India, the government of Gujarat, local industrialists such as the Sarabhai family, the Ford Foundation and the Harvard Business School. As soon as I saw this in the archives, it all felt relatable to the second chapter of Taylor Sherman's book. For the support of the Americans and the energy and initiative of Indian elites was present in the establishment of the Indian Institute of Management. Which brings me to the third big learning as to the role of the Indian elites in the Nehru years immediately after India gained independence. After we gained independence, our constitution outlined a national objective as a preambular value for social justice. A lot of this work rested on Indian elites, where Sherman notes the state rather than challenging existing hierarchies attempted to co-opt them, awaken in elites a sense of trusteeship responsibility towards their fellow countrymen as a form of nationalism that you basically are very gifted in life you have a lot of social economic advantages and you need to work for your country because large sections of society don't have anything at all however as she notes these models of action accidentally reinforced existing hierarchies even as they tried to transform them and towards the end she notes that finally the Nehru era was the zenith of the power of India's nationalistic elites the book notes that even during the Nehru years, there was a lack of representative quality in decision-making around government processes. For instance, when Muslims were only nominally in positions of prominence or Dalits who continued to face discrimination on a daily basis. As the book notes, the first leaders of independent India truly wanted to transform their country. Many of them also had a nuanced understanding on historical change and they grasped that peaceful revolutions that they called for would bring forth consequences that could, they could not foresee nor fully control. As the book concludes, this very lack of foreseeability and yet the glacial incremental pace of political participation which was opening up to other sections of society over a period of time led to transformations that would eventually challenge these very elites who had dominated the Nehru era. The fourth area which interested me was related to public policy development and here the book often refers to the word heuristic which means learning from experience. While I viewed this word in the domain of computer programming, in the context of the book, it means discovery of solutions based on experience rather than dogma. Here reference for instance is made to the Planning Commission's Program Evaluation Organization that contrary to popular belief of proceeding under the straight jacket of a defined five-year plan, studied the working of the programs on the ground level and then made tweaks to the policy itself for it to be implemented on a larger scale. So in many ways, a policy sandbox of some type was also implemented by the Planning Commission way back in the Nehru years. This heuristic approach is also noted in the book, for instance, in designing a new city, for instance, Chandigarh, the approach of public policy which first requires experimentation in which new ways of work were explored. And then the small-scale experiment was seen on the basis of practical experience that would be evaluated and assessed before being rolled out on a larger scale. The fifth and the final part of the book which really excited me was the writing on high modernism. How large dams were the temples of post-independence India or how the Lalit Kala Academy organized the first national exhibition of art that even failed to define what constituted state-sanctioned art. For there was no official prescribed aesthetic or ideological confine. To me, this is not a failing. Actually, it is a benefit. And it is a tremendous boon. For it benefited a curious, syncretic interplay between our past and the present. Between the modern and the ancient. Here I am glad that Sherman notes that the myths that India had to choose between the authoritarian modernism of Nehru or an authentic but stagnant future rooted in Gandhian thought ignores the irrepressible creativity in evidence in the country after independence. This brings me to a note of concern in which there is much to criticize about Nehru. There are many myths about him. Of course, there were many problems given a long stint on the office. If decisions have been made over 17 years, they will be criticized over a period of time. However, what we have seen over the past few years has been an organized trend where irrespective of the nature and the date of a national problem, we can conveniently blame it on Nehru. Rather than examining it deeply, owning up our own responsibility and participation in the creation of that problem itself. This leads to us as citizens of India 
deflecting accountability from our own actions, our own complicity in the world which we see today. I hope at these times, as much as we recognize Nehru's limitations, there is evidence-based criticism. Based on this, I would without question recommend that you purchase and read Taylor Sherman's book on Nehru. Even gift it to a friend and then force them to read it as a punishment for sending that Amit Malviya forward on WhatsApp to you. Thank you so much for watching Amalta's Talks. If you stuck around till the end, please do subscribe to this channel, share this video with your friends. And if you did not like this video, well, after all, you can blame it on Nehru.